So I work at ONS in the methodology division. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in more detail about sample design and the weighting. Uh, this work happened over a number of years, so a number of people were involved. I will thank in particular Robin Davis, who was involved in the early stages on sample design, and Alexandra Pop, who did a lot on the weighting. There were others, Kathy Jones, who obtained some data uh, about schools, and uh, Michael Spratt, who uh, did some coding of the sample selection. So I'm going to cover uh, three items in survey design and then the weighting strategy, and then a little bit of information about the achieved samples on these fruits, the properties. Okay, in terms of sample design, so we've already said that the target population is the resident population in England, aged between 2 and 19. Uh, in terms of sampling frame, because of uh, the efficiency in data collection, there were two candidates. The Child Benefits Records Register well, that was used in 2004 and the NHS Patient Register. The Benefits Register is, I think, uh, now not as good in terms of coverage because of the changes to the child benefits. So we wanted to use the NHS Patient Register, but we had as a backup the Benefits Record. So thankfully, a little bit late in the day, it will, we have received the agreement to, receive, to use the patient register. So in terms of design, it happened in two stages. In the first stage, we selected postcode sectors. So we have at ONS a list of all postcode sectors. Uh, this list is linked to census information. So we have, for each postcode sector, the percentage of households that uh, rent socially, the percentage of uh, people who are unemployed and so on. So we use this information to stratify the list of postcode sectors. So we had an explicit stratification by region and an implicit stratification by the census factors. This allowed us to have a sample that had a good coverage in terms of uh, geography as well as socioeconomic. And then we, in second stage, we selected the children from the patient register. This was done by NHS Digital. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. In terms of what we wanted to achieve, uh, we wanted to have similar numbers to what was achieved in 2004 for the age group 5 to 16. So we needed to achieve 7,000. So we wanted to have about 3,600 in the 5 to 10 and about 3,400 in 11 to 16. And uh, we wanted to have about 1,500 in the 2 to 4, and 1,000 in the age group 17 to 19. So uh, the sampling fractions are not equal, so we had to oversample in the middle age groups. So we had to uh, yeah, oversample by some size. So we worked it out that we, we, we needed the sampling fraction to be 1.5 times the sampling fraction of the 17 to 19. And for the younger age group, it should be 1.36 times higher than the 17 to 19 age groups. In terms of uh, the regional uh, distribution, if we were to have a proportional sample, then the, the northeast would the Northeast will only have a small percentage of the children sampled, 4.7%. So we decided to increase the sample in Northeast and reduce it in the regions that it's uh, very high, for example, Northwest and Southeast. So we ended up with the, the, the percentages on the right-hand side. So we can see that the lowest is 8.5 and the highest is 15.5 in London. So we didn't want to reduce the sample in London. We anticipated higher non-response. So using this information, we calculated the number of postcode sectors that needed to be selected in each region. In terms of uh, calculation of the, the sample size to issue, so we had to make assumptions we assumed that there will be about 5% of children that would not 
be eligible because their address is incorrect and that sort of thing. And we assume that a response rate of 62%, I was probably optimistic, uh, I think, in 2004, they achieved, I think, 65%. So we reduced it a little bit. But I think it turned out to be rather optimistic. So we calculated that we needed to issue about uh, 16,000, sum of 16,000 from the patient register. Uh, so we decided to select 42 children in each postcode sector that was seen to be manageable for field data collection. So we selected uh, 379 postcode sectors. And the selection of these postcode sectors was done proportional to size. I will explain a little bit more later how this is done. And again, in anticipation of lower response rate, we selected a reserve sample of 80 postcode sectors. And we used exactly the same design. Uh, we wanted to cover halls of residence, so we, we in, in, the, in the target population, we have children between so younger adults, 17 to 19. Uh, we wanted to cover students well. Obviously, we know that uh, the student population is difficult to, uh, to sample, so it's quite likely that the patient register would not have the more up-to-date addre addresses of these people. So we thought we needed to go to halls of residence and sample them directly. So we wanted to achieve about 100 interviews. But it turned out that it was difficult to access halls of residence. So in the end, we dropped the, them from the, uh, the sample. In terms of sample selection, so we had to decide uh, how to define age. So we defined age as calculated in August, at the end of August 2017. So the choice of the end of August to facilitate to define children who were at school and, and not at school. So, and the, uh, the data collection happened between April and mostly the end of August. So to make sure that everyone is between two and 19, so we, uh, determined that the uh, date of birth of the target population should be between the 1st of September 1997 and the 31st of March 2015. So this allowed us to have everyone. Now, uh, the selection of children was done from the patient register. We wrote the, uh, the syntax and we sent it to NHS Digital to do selection. In terms of uh, the selection, we wanted to have only one child per household. So we couldn't stratify the sample by age and then select what the number that you require in each stratum. So because if you did this, then you could have more than one child in, in a household. So what we did, we sorted all uh, children in a postcode sector by address, so you could have, say, more than one child next to each other in the same address. And then we selected systematically with proportional to a size measure. I mentioned that we needed the oversampling factors, 1.36 and 1.5. These were the size measures. So we did that and we managed to select the, the sample without having more than one person per household. And when we selected the samples, we uh, Check the distribution matched nearly perfectly the what we wanted to, you know, to, to, to sample. So the sampling selection worked you know, perfectly. In terms of weighting, so we started by computing the design weights to reflect the way we selected the sample, the, because it was an, an equal probability sample. So in the first stage, you have the selection probabilities for the clusters. So this was done within each region. It's indexed by G. So I is for a cluster. So NG is the number of clusters we selected in region G. CI is the size measure of cluster I. The size measure was computed using data from the census because we didn't have access to the patient register at the time. 
So we make, work out a composite size measure to take account of all different ages because we wanted to oversample in you know, the middle of the age range. So, and then in the second stage, we uh, selected the 42 children, as I said, proportion to a size measure to reflect that we wanted to oversample some you know, children between five and 16. So it's proportional, so it's 42 times the size measure. And then in the denominator, you have the, the sum of, you multiply the size by the number of children in that age group that are in that cluster. <laughs> and the design weight is just one divided by the product of the two probabilities. For the reserve sample, we did exactly the same thing, but we, uh, uh, we uh, sorry, subsampled in some age groups. Because in the age two to four, we had enough sample, not, I mean, at least we had less non response than in some of the age groups, for example, 11 to 16. So we subsampled in the age two to four, and I think even in age seven, 17 to 19, maybe. Yeah, I think. So we, so that's the, the factor F in the denominator. That's the sampling fraction in each uh, age group. Okay, in terms of weighting, so we have two samples, the main sample and the reserve sample. So we decided to uh, initially, of course, we computed design weights separately because uh, they had, obviously, slightly different uh, sampling fractions, for example, the, the subsampling. So they were weighted separately, and then they had to be combined together. So we combined them in terms of what's called effective sample size to account for the issued sample size and the design effect that stems from weight variation, because in the reserve sample, we subsampled some age groups, which means that the weights had more variation. So to reflect this, we worked out the design effect from weight variation, which is, it has a very simple form, one plus coefficient variation of the design weights squared. So we combined them, and then uh, <coughs> we wanted to do some adjustment by single year of age because the, the sample may not be very representative but for, each thing, for each age group because of the, uh, the, the, <coughs> I mean, the way we defined age at the end of August and when we did the uh, data collection. So we wanted to, ha to have a sample as representative as possible by single year of age. So once we have done this, the sample, this is the full sample everyone that we selected was representative by region, by socioeconomic indicators uh, from the census, and by single year of age. But we had no response, which obviously affects uh, the representation of the sample. So the first thing we want to do is adjust for non-response, making use of whatever information we have for everyone that was selected. So we had everyone's age from the patient register. And we had some uh, information at area level, for example, where the index of multiple deprivation and whether it's a rural or urban area and whether it is a main sample or the reserve sample, because we not, noted that sampling response was worse, slightly worse in the reserve sample. So we needed to account for this. So we fitted the model and we computed the predicted probability that someone would respond when you, when you have the, for the age and the region and, and the characteristics of the postcode sector. And this gave us the, uh, so the combined, the design weight after the combining the two samples divided by the predicted probability gave us the pre-calibration weight. So in terms of uh, weighting, the final stage, we calibrated the, those you know, the non-response adjusted weights 
to ONS population estimates. So we decided to do it by for different age groups, two to four, five to nine, 10 to 15, 16 by itself. The 16, they are different. Some of them are not at school, so it's quite an interesting you know, age group. And then 17 to 19. So the population estimates uh, were by sex and region within age group, within each age group. Initially, we wanted to use data from schools just to separate people who are still at school, people who are in higher education, people who are in further education, so on. But it turned out to be quite difficult to use published data from these sources to come up with estimates for the time when we were conducting the survey. So we didn't use that. Okay, so a couple of uh, <coughs> pictures and some data about the achieved sample. So I have here the plot of the final weights in the age group 5 to 16. Obviously, so the 5 to 50, so they, they were not weighted all together, but this is, you know, we put them all together. We can see that the distribution is nice and symmetric. We have a small number of cases with large weights. These happened mostly in the, eight, the 16 age group because we see the sample is quite small, 16, it's only one single age. And in some regions, we had a slightly you know, poor response, so which meant that the weights were slightly large. In terms of the achieved sample, so we wanted to see how well it, were, it how representative it is in relation to some other characteristics, which we did not use in the weighting. So we looked at ethnicity. So we uh, <coughs> used data from the school census so to obtain the, the distribution by ethnicity. The school census data for ethnicity does not include private schools. So, it's, so it's, it didn't have you know, the full coverage, but it was still useful. So we can see that the estimates are you know, very close. I think we can explain you know, for white, for example, according to the school census, 74.9. According to the mental health survey, it's 75.5. Some of this comes from the fact that the school census did not include private schools, which have a large proportion of uh, whites. But they looked really good. So I was quite surprised by how well uh, you know, they fitted. We also computed the, uh, I'm not got, I haven't got this in the slide, the number of students people, uh, under 20, so the, uh, in the age group 17 to 19, number of people who were in higher education. And the estimates we got from the survey was actually quite close to the, the rough estimate which I can obtain from HISA data, which was encouraging, because we were worried that we would not capture sufficient number of students but because the data collection, I think, for students happened late, around June, July, I think. I'm not sure, we, but we, we managed to actually capture probably most of the students in that uh, age group and the 20. Okay, in terms of uh, <coughs> the effectiveness of the design, one measure is what's called the, you know, the design factor, the design effect. This captures, uh, this is kind of compares the, uh, the design that we actually used against a simple random sample. So our design is clustered by postcode and it's an, an equal probability sample. So there is weight variation which increases the design effect. Clustering increases the design effect but our sample was stratified, which tends to reduce the design effect, and weighting to population estimates tends to reduce the design effect. Mm. So the net effect is what's given there, design factor, and we can see that they're all very close to one, which means that there is, was very little loss of efficiency from using a cluster design and an equal probability sample. Okay, it was mentioned earlier that uh, response to the teacher questionnaire wasn't as good as 
we wanted it to be. So obviously we had to do uh, something about it because uh, there was no scoring by the teacher. So the overall score, you know, rating is not going to be as good as when the teacher scores uh, available. So we had to do something uh, to compensate for this. I'll show you the method. It's very simple. Uh, so what we did is, uh, this is the, the, the method. So we revise the estimates. This is for each disorder. We revise the estimates of the number of who have disorder of, in the group that did not have the teacher questionnaire. How do we revise this? So using a ratio adjustment. So you can see in the formula, so you have the, the estimate from those who have a teacher questionnaire. You divide that by the estimate from the, the parent scoring. And you multiply that by the equivalent estimate for the group without a teacher questionnaire. So it is a ratio adjustment. So we assume that there is a good relationship between the, the final kind of clinical score and the, the teacher, uh, sorry, the parents' scoring. And to implement this uh, revision in the weighting, because we don't want to compute this revised for, you know, for every group, so we wanted to, to incorporate it directly into the weighting, and this is done by working out that teacher adjustment factor. So you can see that in the numerator, it's the estimate of, this is kind of the true estimate you, and after revision. And then in the denominator, it's the estimate before revision. So as you can see in the next slide, the, <coughs> the adjustment tends to be higher than one because when you incorporate the teacher score, the uh, the chance that someone would be classed as having a disorder increases a little bit. But it's not the same for, it, it does vary between disorders. If you look at the hyperactivity disorder, you can see that it's unchanged. That means that the teacher questionnaire responses did not affect the final clinical score. I want to have a chat now about how we actually collected the data from the children, the young people, and the parents, and the teachers as well. Um, just to reiterate what we set out to do. So we aim to collect data about 9,500 children and young people. Uh, the emphasis on the word about, there's lots of different ways you can explain this, but we interviewed, we collected information from multiple informants. So we aim to have assessments of mental disorders for 9,500 children and young people. And as we've said a few times now, we look to collect that information from parents, from children, and also from teachers as well. And I've got a couple of I've got some slides now to show how that differed depending on the age of the child, which might explain why there's some differences between where a teacher interview was present and not as well. Um, the mode of collection we did primarily was computer-assisted personal interviews and self-interviews. Um, essentially, we collected a lot of information of different topics. Uh, the majority of the interview was conducted by an interviewer administered mode, with the questions being asked by the interviewer to the parent or to the child. But we also collected some sensitive questions as well, or things that might have been biased by the fact if it was said out, out, out loud in front of a, a parent, such as smoking, drinking, drug use, and other behaviours as well. So what we wanted to do is have this self-completion mode included in the questionnaire. And as we've said before, teachers, uh, we, we unfortunately couldn't send an interviewer to interview every teacher. So we did a paper and uh, online questionnaire for teachers to take part. So for two to four year olds, we interviewed the parents only. Funnily enough, as, as Tamsin said, although it would be lovely to chat to a two to four year old, um, perhaps that information is not quite uh, as helpful. I've got a three year old at home who thinks that the word yesterday means any time in the past. So I guess that kind of time frame is, is lovely, but might not be that helpful. So asking the parents, we did the interview administered questions and also self completion. For five to 10 year olds, it was the same for the parent, but we introduced the teacher interview for this age group. 
although it would have been interesting maybe to include nursery workers for two to four year olds or another source of information there it was out of the scope of our design to be able to do that and it might not have provided consistent enough information for you anyway because not all preschoolers are in nursery <coughs> For our 11 to 16 year olds, um, this is where we collected the most information from the most sources. So we had our parent interview, we had our teacher interview as well, but we also interviewed the 11 to 16 year old themselves. And the questions were either administered by an interviewer or there was also the self-completion element as well of some of the questions that were more sensitive as, as we mentioned. And then finally, the 17 to 19 year olds, the primary point of contact for 17 to 19 year olds was the 17 to 19 year old himself. They are becoming essentially an adult in de many definitions and they were our primary source of information. But we did attempt to get interviews with the parents where possible as well. And I've got a slide to show what numbers of interviews we had per, um, per informant later on. Okay, so there was a question raised earlier about the sensitivities around kind of interviewing children and, and, and parents and I think that's something just to touch upon here that due to the nature of what we're asking about and, and perhaps um, influence that might have about asking these questions with other people present, we, we gave interviewers guidance to suggest that where possible interviews with parents should be conducted without the sample child present and also if we're interviewing an 11 to 16 year old we asked interviewers to do this without the parent present. Now, before alarm bells ring, we weren't asking the parent to go out to the shops and leave the child alone with the interviewer. It was clear that there needed to be a parent present in the household. But what we wanted is to try to allow an open conversation to happen without other people listening in. And, and again, as, as Catherine mentioned, with the um, potential overlap of the questions as well for the parent and then the child, we didn't want them to feel like it was a duplication of effort it was actually really important to get that information from the parent and then from the child to give Tamsin's team enough information to make assessments we wanted therefore we needed to be really clear of our ethical applications that we put in about how we were going to protect those who took part in the survey and not just the participants but also how you protect the people administering the research as well the researchers and the interviewers so the first thing we made really clear was that everyone who worked on the survey who was going to the households needed to have a disclosure and bar and service standard level check. There's lots of different levels of checks that you can get and I won't go into any detail there because I'm not an expert, but that's what every interviewer needed to be happy to have that clearance in order to work on the survey. We also made sure interviewers during our briefing sessions were given really clear and dedicated safeguarding training and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the term of safeguarding and what it means, but just for those who aren't, essentially we're talking about protecting people's health, well-being and human rights and enabling them to live from, free from harm, abuse and neglect. Now those are the three key words there. And what we made sure was that interviewers were given very clear guidance of what to do if they came across a household where they were concerned about something happening and what they would then be expected to do and done consistently. Although you might think a survey of mental health, you would find more issues. It's not necessarily the case. So this training is given now to all interviewers across NATS and an ONS standard anyway, um, because when you go into a household, you don't know what you're going to be going into. But particularly because of the sensitivity of the survey, we wanted to make sure people were clear what they needed to do. Um, and also, we left people with um, every participant was left with a leaflet. Uh, which gave advice if they were affected by any of the topics. This was given regardless of whether they showed signs of being affected, because obviously we're not mind readers, um, but also because of the self-completion element of the questionnaire. There might have been some things brought up there that the interviewer was unaware of. And um, essentially all it said in there, uh, all it said uh, at the beginning, was that if you've been affected by anything uh, you have discussed during the interview, then here's some contact details of organisations you might find helpful. And it gave the, the kind of advice the NHS would give, talk to your GP, uh, call these, these numbers, and also go to several charities who might be able to help. So moving on now to response rates. And I'll break this table down a little bit so you don't just look at a table of numbers here. But um, as we mentioned before, we issued an overall sample of 18,029 addresses. We, that actually was broken down to 15,690 that were originally issued. 
And then we had a further reserve sample of 2,339, which I hope adds up to the 18029, um, which was our reserve sample. And that was targeted at certain age groups where response rates were not as high as perhaps we had anticipated um, during, during the design stage. Um, we had an, an eligibility rate of 2%, 393, which is quite low if you took that sample design. If we were going to households randomly across a postal address file, you'd expect that to be massive in terms of finding households with children. So it was really good that the using the NHS patient register gave us a sample design that had such a low rate of ineligibility. But those that were ineligible still were those were potentially where a sample participant had actually was no longer resident at that address when we went to the to the make contact with the household. So it wasn't possible to completely wipe out ineligibles, but it was at least limited. So we were left with 17,636 eligible households. And of those, we had a refusal rate of 28%. Um, and that was either a refusal on the doorstep to our interviewer, but we also gave in our advanced materials a number to call if people wanted to opt out prior to an interviewer making contact, uh, which, which also drove that uh, refusal rate. We had a non-contact rate of 12%, which obviously non-contacts can be of various reasons. A lot of those could be that the eligible person wasn't present in the address potentially, as well as other reasons of just not being able to make contact at that address anymore. And then there were other unproductive reasons, which uh, accounted for the remainder 8% there, leaving us with a response rate of 52% overall, which if those who remember the figure Salah gave us 62% is a bit short of what we were expecting. But at the same time, response rates across household surveys are declining from perhaps 10 years ago as well, or 13 years ago when the survey was last conducted. So that still gave us 9,117 addresses, which is just short of our 9,500 target. Um, going back to a question that was asked before, the majority of our completed interviews were full. So it gave us the full me mental disorder information that Tamsin and her team were able to make use of. Uh, there were some partial interviews that we were still able to use in the data, but were perhaps um, not as much information as we would have liked. I think it was just a basic screener questionnaire, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, and one of the more complex blocks, wasn't it, I think? So, yeah, so it gave enough information to make a judgment, but perhaps just not as much as we would like. But luckily, that was a small proportion of the overall cases. So you'd expect on any survey that response rates would differ depending on characteristics, and they did differ by age. So for our two to four and five to 10 year olds, you could see that the response rates were highest around the 56 to 57% mark, um, with refusal rates around a quarter of those cases were resulted in refusals. When you look at the 11 to 16 year olds, response dropped to 50%. And that was mainly driven by an increase in refusals here, up to 31%. And then for our 17 to 19 year olds, this was the hardest group to make contact with, 40% uh, response rate overall. Um, the refusal rate, interestingly, was the same for 11 to 16 and 17 to 19 year olds, but it was an increase in the non-contact and other unproductives as well that drove that. So obviously that's what we ended up with, but just a little bit to talk about what we try to do to improve response throughout the survey. Catherine mentioned earlier about the, the advanced letters we sent out, and there was a little bit on the bottom that showed about an incentive. What we offered every household was an unconditional £10 incentive to take part in the survey. This was a post office voucher, and I think you just trimmed the bottom of the letter off, took it to the post office, and it would give you cash in return if it was that simple, wasn't it, or something along those lines. I, I didn't take part, so I don't know how it worked. Um, I never got one of those. Um, but essentially, it was an unconditional incentive to the household that they, they could take part. And obviously, there's evidence to suggest that's a goodwill gesture, encourages participants to take part in the survey. Um, 11 to 16 year olds as well were given, entered into a prize draw, which gave them a love to shop gift card of £20. And there were 50 uh, successful participants. I won't say winners, because that might have correlations with other things which, which we're not endorsing, but um, they were selected at random to win a voucher at the end of it, basically. Um, we then had a named sample, which was another really big bonus to try and promote the survey and maximise response. Uh, 
Uh, so we had a person level sampling frame, which meant that we could address a, a letters to parents with the name child on it. So if you receive a letter through the door, if it doesn't have your name on it, you're probably going to chuck it in the bin if you don't know what it's about. But having the sam name of the child on the letter just distinguishes it from other mailings that come in and hopefully gets past that first step of, of not being looked at. Um, so that was a really helpful thing to try and maximise contact. In terms of then during field work, we were able to get the NHS patient register and the NHS digital to provide us with updated addresses during field work. So often people move addresses, uh, quite potentially quite regularly, but from the point the sample was drawn to the point we wanted to make contact, someone might have moved. So any households who had then re-registered at a new GP, we were able to get that information from NHS Digital to then go to the new address where possible. Uh, there was a couple of exceptions there. If the person had moved out of England, for example, they were no longer in scope to take part in the survey, so they weren't contacted. And if someone had moved quite far away in, in England, we did attempt to make contact, but there's obviously then the kind of practicalities of doing that during the field period we had. But it, it enabled us to maximise participation where possible. We also reissued, so most social surveys will reissue cases to try and maximise response and reduce bias. And I believe 4% of our main sample was reissued ultimately. Um, and this included those addresses where no contact was made and also those addresses that had refused but were maybe soft refusals so, or circumstantial refusals, which meant that if we went back again in the future, they might be able to take part now. And as I mentioned before, we did issue a reserve sample. So all things, you know, all these things that we try to do, obviously there's still limitations of how successful they are. So issuing a reserve sample meant that we were able to boost the response to the target number of interviews we wanted to achieve, but it doesn't necessarily improve your response rate because you're adding extra cases in to begin with. But it was a useful to try and maximise the number of people who did take part. So this next slide gives you an idea of what the interview length was. I just want to caveat it while there's the word provisional and a little footnote on the bottom. This was done based on a selection of cases. It's not done across the whole sample, but it does give you an idea of what we found roughly to be the interview length. And what we did find is that overall cases are around the 60 to 90 minute mark on average. Um, you probably expect those that were shorter were probably those where one person households took place and where one person informants took place and those that were longer were the ones where two two informants took place in the survey but also that could be the ones that were really longer were the ones that are more complex issues at hand which meant that there needed to be a bit more uh, you know more uh, information given and perhaps some more um, multiple visits going on in those households as well but anecdotally as well, we found when talking to interviewers, those really long interviews are over challenging. They were perhaps most rewarding and important interviews to take place as well. I'm going to skip this slide because you kind of, Catherine's talked about it already, so it probably doesn't have much value. But what we then found in terms of teacher response was that uh, overall of those eligible to take part, we received consent from 89% of those to take part in the survey. And then we, uh, of those, as Catherine said, we needed to clean a lot of that information to make sure that it was appropriate to make contact with schools so we weren't right into the flamingo class head teacher and things like that. So we uh, actually invited 86% of our eligible sample to take part in the teacher questionnaire. And of those uh, that were eligible to take part and invited to take part, 63% then actually provided a response. So there's two things going on here. You've got the percentage of what was eligible and ultimately the percentage of what was who were invited. But to put it into numbers, 3,595 3 teacher interviews or questionnaires were returned. And that differed depending on the mode. So two thirds were conducted on paper and a third were conducted by online. And maybe we were expecting a higher uptake on online, but it was good that we were able to offer a multi-mode approach to try and maximise as many responses as possible here. This slide now goes into a bit more detail to show the number of responses or information we received from each respondent. 
uh, by the age uh, of the sample child. So for our two to four year olds, we received 1,463 interviews with parents. So that was information on 1,463 two to four year olds. For the five to 10 year olds, we had 3,595 3, interviews with parents, which were the primary source of information. And then we had a teacher interview with 2,050 of those, which I think works out at around 57% of those where we, we wanted to get a teacher interview, actually provided a teacher interview. For the 11 to 16 year olds there, you can see we had 3,121 interviews with parents who were again with a primary source of information. We then got interviews with 2,609 children and young people. And then subsequently, interviews with 1,545 teachers. Now, it's important to note here that that figure at the bottom, 1,545, doesn't mean we had three sources of information because Tamsin's team might have got information with just a parent and a teacher without the child present. It wasn't kind of a sequential approach to this. <coughs> and then finally, for our child and young people, we had 936 children and young people, I say children, these are 17 to 19 year olds basically, so young people. Uh, it's 936 young people who took part as a primary source of contact. And then subsequently 421 parent interviews were uh, achieved, which is quite a low uptake, 45%. But again, it was the parent, the child and young person, the 17 to 19 year old who were mainly making contact. And there were many reasons why a parent wasn't possible, potentially not living at the addresses of the sampled young person. So my final slide is to show, we talked about earlier about the impact of non-response at a unit level, so the respondents. But I just wanted to finish on showing what we had at an item level as well. Um, and this slide shows you the key break variables we used in our reports, which I think the next session will show you the results from the survey by these key break variables. But it gives you an idea of the levels of non-response we had to individual questions by age group. Um, the usual suspects are on there, so income, benefits are questions where it's often quite hard to get information from households. And for our two to 16 year olds, we had around 10% item non-response for these questions. Um, there were other questions around family function and parental mental health where we had a low level of item non-response, uh, but, but albeit numbers there. For our 17 to 19 year olds, we did have a higher level of item non-response, um, around the 50% mark uh, for household income and benefits and also for the family functioning. Now, if you take that back to the earlier slide, that's probably driven by the fact that a lot of parents were unable to take part. Um, and with all data collection that we do, we have to make assumptions around what we collect and what interpretation that has. So when we did our analysis for 17 to 19 year olds, we did exclude those who didn't, item non-response was excluded from our analysis. Obviously that, that will affect people's interpretation, but you have to make assumptions as well. So we assumed that those who did not take part were not adversely affected the estimates, and that was made clear in our results as well. But it's just to highlight here the levels of item non-response in each question uh, that was available on the survey. Has anyone in the room seen the report findings? Yes. Yeah. OK, a little bit. So we'll, um, we'll try and kind of get the right balance of not overloading you too much or, you know, just um, let me know if you want me to slow down or whatever. But um, basically, these are, as Tim said, there's been a whole load of topic reports that have been published. Um, uh, this is a snapshot from each of those topic reports. Um, the first one being, uh, as we've mentioned before, one of the main aims of this survey was to look at the, whether the prevalence of mental disorders has changed over time. So we've done a, an analysis um, looking at the 99 data, 2004 data and 2017 data. As Tim mentioned earlier, the age ranges are slightly different and obviously this time round we're only England, whereas previously um, there were other countries involved. Um, so these, this analysis is based on the 5 to 15 year olds across each of the three surveys. Um, so uh, looking at the rates of any disorder among that age group, we've seen that there is a 
small but significant increase in the prevalence of mental disorder, rising from 9.7 up to 11.2. So it is a significant change. It's a significant increase over time. Um, and that has been seen amongst both boys and girls as well. Um, this has largely been driven by a rise in emotional disorders. Um, so you can see there uh, from that line, it's 4.3% in 99, and it's risen, emotion, prevalence of um, emotional disorders has risen to 5.8% in 2017. Um, the prevalence of behavioural and hyperactivity disorders is pretty stable. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, this has largely been driven by a rise in em prevalence of emotional disorders. Um, and it's just interesting to look at um, emotional disorders a little bit more by boys and girls. In this slide, you can see that it has been um, an increase in both boys and girls. So amongst boys, it's risen from 4.2% up to 5.6%. Um, in 2017, and among girls, it was 4.4% in 99, and that's risen up to 6.1% in 2017. Um, more detail around um, the trends uh, can be found in the first topic report that's been published, but they're the, the kind of headline findings from that report. <coughs> Actually, do you want to... <laughs> You're meant to do this, but... Sorry, we're just going to swap over now. <laughs> there you go. We, um, we're following the same format that we did when we presented this to a press briefing, so but we're going to do it a bit quicker, aren't we? So, yeah. That's all right, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll probably do the same as well. Yeah, so, um, so the trends were one of the key things that we wanted to cover, um, but also it's to give you an idea of what the snapshot was uh, in 2017 about the presence of mental disorders. So we found one in eight uh, five to 19 year olds had a mental disorder in 2017 and to put that into context uh, if you have a classroom of 24 children three children would have a mental disorder based on these statistics um, we also found that one in 20 uh, children and young people experience more uh, yeah one in 20 children and young people have experienced more than one uh, met the criteria for two or more individual mental disorders at the same time so that's known as comorbidity, essentially, and children with more than one mental disorders can have complex needs, which is important to know the rate of children with com comorbid mental disorders. As I mentioned before, the preschool children were included in the survey for the first time, and we found one in 18 uh, preschool children, that's 5.5%, had a mental disorder. Um, and early childhood is an important phase for, uh, for children where they, uh, a child develops language and other social skills. So it's really important to capture this information, particularly before they enter the educational, educational system as well. So one in 18, two to four year olds, as we are, we've just mentioned. Um, rates increase with age, with age, essentially. So for five to 10 year olds, we found one in 10, uh, five to 10 year olds had a mental disorder. That's 9.5%. Uh, Increased into one in seven or 14.4 percent uh, secondary school age children, that's 11 to 16 year olds, and it was highest in 17 to 19 year olds, uh, one in six or 16.9 percent. We also found there were differences between boys and girls by age. Um, so for two to fours and five to tens, you could see that the rates were higher in boys than girls for the presence of any mental disorder. Um, when we get to secondary school age, we found that that kind of leveled off a bit. And in fact, there were similar rates in, of mental disorders in boys and girls at this age. And then for your 17 to 19 year olds, there's a big difference. So the rates of girls, 23.9% uh, of girls, what's that, nearly one in four uh, 17 to 19 year old young women had a mental disorder compared to one in 10 boys, uh, young men at that age. The types of disorders differed as well by age. So for two to fours and five to tens, we could see behavioral disorders were among the most common type of disorder experience for these age groups. But when you look at 11 to 16, the so 17 to 19 year olds, you can see the increase in emotional disorders uh, uh, becoming present in, in age groups of that, of that age. So 
probably as you've seen from these last two slides, the 17 to 19 year olds are where there's the highest rates of mental disorders. So just to take a focus on that group, uh, we found nearly one in four had a mental disorder, as I mentioned before. We also found that just over one in five young women had an emotional disorder as well, that's 22.4%. And perhaps quite shockingly, one in two young women with a disorder had reported having self-harmed or made a suicide attempt, um, which is very striking. We found differences between region. Uh, the, the differences between region here, I believe, show that there were differences between London and the rest of the U uh, England, not the UK. Um, but the differences between other parts of England weren't necessarily significant. So we were able to say that London had the lowest rates of mental disorders, but we weren't able to then compare those with the other regions due to the overlapping confidence intervals and significance tests that we had. We also found differences between ethnic group with the white British uh, children aged 5 to 19 had higher rates of mental disorders compared to other ethnic uh, children of ethnic backgrounds, uh, as you can see there on this chart. We looked at sexual identity in this survey, um, which was really important for the survey to capture information about uh, other elements of the child's identity. And uh, sexual identity was one of those things we wanted to look at. So we asked this question of 14 plus year olds, so 14 to 19 year olds. And it was a question asking um, how a child identified themselves um, against various categories that was provided to them. And we found that young people who identified as either lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or as another non-heterosexual sexual identity, the wording in the question was a bit more friendlier than this, um, only a little bit, um, um, were, were more likely to have a mental disorder compared to those children who identified as heterosexual. We also looked at elements of uh, social and family context here. We found that children with a mental disorder were more likely to live in a family that struggled to function well, and as well as parents that struggle, um, as well as living in parents uh, that struggled with their own mental health. Um, it's important with all of these things that we're talking about that, the, that we're not implying causation of one to the other here. So, uh, for example, here, the fact that 27.9% of children who live in a family where a parent has poor mental health had a mental disorder themselves compared to 9.4% uh, of those who come from a family without parental mental health problems. It's not necessarily to say that the parental mental health is the cause of that. It could be the fact that a, it could be a, a two-way direction there where the mental health difficulties a child might have might affect a parent's mental health as well. There's lots of literature around it, but this survey isn't able to, it doesn't say definitively which way the cause is, it just presents the evidence that we found to, to spark further research. This is from the topic report, um, which is titled Behaviours, Lifestyles and Identities. And I've just picked out a couple of indicators based on the new modules of questions that um, a lot of our um, people who responded to the consultation asked for. Um, so we asked a series of social uh, questions about social media for 11 to 19 year olds. Um, and we found, we did a comparison, um, as Tim mentioned earlier in his earlier presentation, we wanted to do a comparison of those with a disorder compared to those without a mental disorder. So we found that those um, with a disorder spend more time on social media. Um, so here you can see that um, around a quarter with a disorder spend less than an hour on social media. Sorry, no, a quarter with a disorder spend um, less than an hour on social media compared to uh, around 42% of those with no disorder. Um, and if I go through to the end there, the, the around a third, just under a third of those with a disorder spend more than four hours a day um, on social media compared to 12% of those without a disorder. This is within the questionnaire, we um, asked a series of questions on a typical school day and on a non-school day. Um, these results are based on a typical school day, but it was a very similar profile um, when you look at these results on a typical non-school day. Um, and looking at the impact um, of social media, um, we asked a series of questions um, which uh, the 11 to 19 year old um, either, you know, agree, disagree statements. 
Um, and we found that those with a disorder were more likely to compare themselves to others, um, to report that the number of likes, comments and shares impacted on their mood, to also spend more time on social media than they meant to, and also that they couldn't be honest about their feelings. Um, so, yeah, quite, quite kind of striking um, results there. And just picking up the cyberbullying questions as well. So we asked um, 11 to 19 year olds their experiences of being cyberbullied, but also a series of questions of whether they had ever cyberbullied others themselves. So this first slide is on those um, that reported having been cyberbullied in the last year. Um, we found that one in five reported that they had been cyberbullied in the last year. And when we look at that by um, whether or not they have a disorder, boys and girls as well, we found that those with a disorder um, were more likely to have been cyberbullied in the last year, around a third of boys compared to just under 15% of, of boys without a disorder. And similarly for girls as well, we can find that those um, with a disorder were more likely to report having been cyberbullied in the last year compared to those without a disorder. And interestingly, as I mentioned, we um, asked um, questions of whether they'd cyberbullied others. And there's actually a real need here as well. Um, you can see here that um, that overall message at the top that one in 12 reported to having cyberbullied others in the past year. And again, there's a difference between whether um, the um, 11 to 19 year old had a disorder or not. So here you can see that among boys, um, nearly twice as many boys with a disorder reported cyberbullying others in the last year. Um, boys with a disorder compared to those without a disorder and similarly for girls as well. Um, the, the rates of um, having cyberbullied others among those with a disorder was markedly higher than those without a disorder. Um, we also asked a number of questions, um, as we've mentioned, around risky behaviours. Um, this is just a very broad summary, but we found that children with a disorder were more likely to have taken illicit drugs, 13.9% compared to 4%, to have drunk alcohol, 36% um, compared to 22.7%, and also to have ever tried a cigarette. Um, they're the kind of... They're, some of those questions are then within the questionnaire broken down into more detail, but they're the kind of headline findings from that module of questions. And then just to touch on the um, questions that we asked around education and service use. Um, we found that children with a disorder were more likely to um, have played truant in the past year. It's quite a big difference there, 8.5% um, compared to just under 1%. And also children with a disorder to, more likely to have been excluded. Um, again, a big difference there between those with a disorder compared to those without a disorder. So there's a real, there's a real need there as well. Um, and it, hopefully this information will be really useful for schools. Um, again, in the report, it's in the um, professional, I've forgotten the title of the report, professional, anyway, the service use report. Professional help and educate. Um, yeah, there's more detail in there around these figures. Um, we also um, asked a series of questions around service use. Um, and this slide reports on whether um, a, a, a parent had been in contact with services over a concern about their ch child's mental health. Um, and we found that um, among children with a disorder, two thirds of their parents had been in contact with a professional service um, in, at some point in the past year. Um, and of those, a quarter had been in contact with a mental health specialist. But we also asked about informal um, support that um, might have been accessed, such as um, family members or friends. Um, and we found that just under half of uh, children with a disorder, their parents had 
sought help from some sort of informal um, support. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the really hugely important work that we have done from the data from the previous surveys. Um, and then, unfortunately, Dan Collison from NHS Digital was going to come and talk about um, data access, um, but was not able to make it. So I'm going to do my best to stand in for him, but I'm not part of NHS Digital, so I, I only know what I've been told so far. So um, behind me are a totally unreadable list of some of the references <laughs> from the previous surveys. Um, these surveys turn up in pretty much every policy document. That one in 10 figure, that comes from the 99 survey and the 2004 survey. They're referenced in pretty much every significant child mental health policy document over the last couple of decades. And in fact, this most recent survey was mentioned in the NHS um, long-term plan, which you know came out almost the same time. Um, both the 99 survey and the 2004 survey were followed up three years later, and that means we've been able to get beyond the problem of cross-sectional data, where you have these amazing samples, but you don't know what's chicken and egg because you're collecting both at the same time. So, in fact, my PhD was on the first survey in terms of, OK, so we've done this amazing survey. We know now know have we now have... UK estimates or Great Britain estimates of how many children might need a service, but how many of them do we actually see? And okay, we ask at the time, how many did you see? In fact, I'm sure Howard wouldn't mind me saying, in the first survey, because it was kind of everyone was in a hurry and it was kind of an add-on, you couldn't differentiate between paediatrics in the general hospital and mental health services because for most conditions it wouldn't matter, but actually for child mental health, so even cross-sectionally in the first survey, we couldn't answer the service use question, which is kind of really important for government. And it was one of the reasons that they did follow up the survey. So what you see here is um, the proportion um, in the dark grey with the psychiatric disorder who have been seen, and a slightly unusual graph because um, it's not so useful to know how many without a disorder are going to be seen but if you are a public health commissioner you do want to know what fraction of your population you might be needing to serve and there are two things that really stand out which was just not thought of first of all our education services are frontline mental health services particularly teachers and they're not trained and they're not particularly supported in in that role the second issue was over a three-year period of time, this is prospective service use, starting from whether or not there was a mental health condition, um, only a quarter of them got to a specialist mental health service. And that was, de that was um, defined quite broadly. So it wasn't only child mental health services. It would have been counsellors in schools, GP services, and um, in voluntary sector organisations. So it's not just the very specialist services. Now, the heavy burden on schools translates into massive costs. Um, now, the, the follow-up data on service use was gathered in two stages. First of all, a questionnaire, one at 18 months and then one in the resurvey at three years, which said, you know, since we last saw you, have you seen anyone? Um, and then for those who did say they had had service contact, I spoke to them. And a sample of service-relevant screen negatives, so the ones who said they were worried about their child's mental health at both data points, but hadn't seen anyone. The, the, you know, if we'd done a a, 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 just a random sample of screen negatives, we'd got a whole load of people who said, no, I didn't see anyone, because you don't go and see anyone if you're not worried. But the ones who are saying they think their child has a mental health problem, they're concerned, yet don't go and see someone are, are important. Um, and I had thought that I'd be able to work out what they actually got the same way I would in the clinic. I couldn't, that bit of my PhD, I, the data just wasn't strong enough. But anecdotally, a lot of these school contacts were expensive multidisciplinary meetings where 
lots of people come along. There's usually some crisis, often disciplinary. Lots of people come along. It costs a fortune, but it doesn't come off anyone's budget. But, it, you know, it's lots of expensive salaries who sit around the room. Nothing much happens. They go away again, and then it all happens again in a few weeks later. I can see some people I know who are teachers nodding. Um, we're spending a lot of money on mental health in schools, and then we could be bright and spend it better. And hopefully, with the green paper, we will do. This work was replicated between 2004 and 2007 by Tamsin Nulab Delgado, who's a public health um, academic. Um, and she found pretty much the same thing. So this wasn't a one-off finding. But also, one of the questions I get asked when I present the survey data is, yeah, but they grow out of it. You know, how, how many of these kids have the equivalent of a cold? Well, I could show you other data that shows that symptoms and difficulties persist, um, as do disorder. Um, and it's the same for services. So if you think about the children who have no disorder, either at the baseline survey or follow-up, then you've got some children who start off with a disorder, but it resolves. Or you have children who don't have a disorder to begin with, and one emerges. And then you have the poor souls who um, have a disorder at both time points. And your chances of being in contact with an educational professional, that's almost a dose response. So the kids with the more severe problems are getting more services, but not very many of them. We need to do better. Um, and this is the same thing for any service contact. So to pick it apart, the bottom blue line is um, the children who are... Um, you know, the symptoms of the children who don't have any contact. So this is dimension rather than disorder. And you can see they're scoring quite low. The dotted line, which is round about where the red line for the children with service contact at both times, is hovering around the borderline. Borderline and abnormal is above it. And that may surprise you with the strong association with disorder. But actually, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire doesn't ask much about eating disorders mm. or autism, for example. So it is quite possible to have a mental health condition and not score above the clinical cut point on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. But basically, one thing we can be proud of is the kids with the worst problems are the ones that are accessing services. And that, when I presented this data in the States, they're surprised that wouldn't be the case. It would be around whether you had insurance or not. Um, so I said symptoms and impact persist. Actually, once you had two surveys that could use the same methodology and were followed up three years later, then you can start studying persistence of disorder, which very few people have done, because even with this massive 10,500 children in the first survey, we were left with um, just over 900, 929 with a disorder. And then when you break that disorder down into types of disorder, you very quickly run out of power. But then we've got two big surveys, or possibly now three, if we can convince anybody to follow the third one up. And you can start looking forward because you have enough cases. And really interestingly, we found the same that Michael Rutter found in the 1970s with the Isle of Wight, which is about half of those when you I've called it persistence. Of course, it's not. We've got two, sh two um, snapshots. We don't precisely know what's happened in between. Um, but kids who have any disorder at one point, half of them will have any disorder at the next point. It won't surprise the child psychiatrists and probably anybody else who works with children that the disruptive disorders are the ones that are more likely to be persistent. And when I'm talking here about meeting the same diagnostic criteria or what we'd call homotypic persistence because actually it's possible that you start off with an anxiety disorder and say end up with depression or you start off with ADHD and you end up with conduct disorder that would be heterotypic persistence so you can study any disorder to any disorder and then after that the data I'm going to show you because it gets hideously complicated when you start thinking about one disorder going off to these other disorders. We are just about to submit and publish on it. But the disruptive disorders have a higher rate of persistence than the emotional disorders. And then these are the factors that predict from baseline. The ones in black were in our final model. The ones in um, purple were bubbling just under, but we were doing lots of tests, so we were very strict with our 
um, significance levels and our confidence intervals. And you'll see we didn't have enough power to, to really study depression. So adding this third survey in would allow us to think about depression. It might give us enough cases to start thinking about autism and eating disorders, which we couldn't do because they weren't measured in the first survey. Um, so yes, anyone who's got the ear of government or funders, push to get these followed up. And just on a completely different tack, and because I know a lot of people here are methodologists, I want to show you something a bit more akin to methodology, um, rather than the very sort of practical stuff that I've been talking about. So, when you work in a clinic, you have a real problem um, knowing whether you're doing any good. Um, People don't give psychiatrists presents, really. Um, they often drop out of treatment. You know, we deal with people at tough times of their lives and in tricky situations. And how do you demonstrate to commissioners that what you're doing works? And one way is to use routine outcome measures. But as the statisticians will tell you, you've got several reasons um, why that on its own is, is not Good enough. Now, those of you who've got children will know that you get a little red book and in it has some charts which are based on epidemiological data. Actually, they come from the 1970s, so they probably don't relate very much to your children. They're stratified by gender, so one for boys, one for girls, but by nothing else. But they're good enough to keep an eye on kids' weight and height and body mass index. So Robert and I were thinking, well, can, can't we do something with this data? So we persuaded ONS um, and DH that this was worth doing, and they did a six-month follow-up of the first third of, of the kids who were surveyed in the 2004 survey, from which we tried to empirically build um, a model that would give you the added value score, because you will get a drop um, for children who attend clinic, whether you're any good at all. So if you're a clinician, don't worry about your outcome measures because they will look all right. And the reason they will look all right is that childhood mental health problems fluctuate. But people come and see you when they're bad. And they may sit on a waiting list for ages, but I reckon if you were taking regular measures, there would be a differential with higher scores amongst those that actually kept their appointment compared to those that don't turn up when you call them in because actually it's a bit better now. The other thing is um, attenuation. Now, this is a really irritating epidemiological um, phenomena whereby if you... Um, measure something twice, people just report less the second time round, and there's no way past this. And then something called regression to the mean. So these are, again, the SDQ data. Um, time one, our baseline survey. Time two, the three-year follow-up. Those scoring one standard deviation above at the top and below, and then those in between in three lines. And what you can see is those that were high scoring and low scoring as you would predict statistically, it's just an irritating thing. They score, they move towards the mean. The problem is, in the clinic, we see that lot. And that's why our outcome data is always going to look good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing if the clinic's not doing very well. You know, those of us who actually want to see whether we're making a difference, that's not good. So to give you an example of attenuation, this is some of the service interviews I did. So different levels of accessing services. And then I did two interviews to test the measure. Now, it's quite possible that in the month between my interviewing people, there would be people who move from assessment only to treatment. So the fact that that drops dramatically is not surprising. But then you don't see a rise in the treatments they could have accessed. And that, that's this phenomenon of attenuation, the kind of people just say less the, the next time round. So we took the 2004 survey and the six-month follow-up, and we took the children who in 2004 were rated as having a psychiatric disorder or their parent had said they'd spoken to a teacher or a, a primary health care, so GP nurse, health visitor, about their child's mental health within the previous year as the kind of sample that we're interested in, the service relevant sample. And we empirically tried to predict their time to SDQ score. And that is the equation. Anna Goodman did this, this work with Robert. 
So basically, the added value score is the expected minus the um, observed score, which means if it's positive, you are doing better at follow-up. If it's negative, you're doing worse than expected at follow-up. And if it's zero, you've made no difference. Well, um, the other thing about using this added value score, of course, in the, in the survey, we've got all these background variables. The raw scores vary hugely by the other background variables. And one thing we hadn't expected but were delighted to find is the variance by background factors for the added value score is very small. So again, that's really useful if what you're just trying to parcel out is the bit of the reduction in scores that's down to the clinic. But we needed to see whether it worked. Um, and it came to me that if we could find a randomized controlled trial that used the SDQ in a clinically relevant sample and found a difference between the control and the intervention arm, well, then could we run the algorithm separately for the control and the intervention arm? And would we find a difference? Um, one such trial, although I have to say they made life difficult for themselves because they used the wrong version of the SDQ. It was two to three year olds who had an incredible year's um, um, parenting course up in Wales. It was Judy Hutchins' data, but they used the school age um, SDQ, which will underestimate change in very young children because their behavior just won't be so severe, so it'll be less sensitive. The other thing is at follow-up, they didn't use the follow-up version of the SDQ, which only asks over a month, and the course is only I, I think it's 12 weeks, so it's only three months long. Um, they used the, the standard version, which also is six months. Again, that's going, you know, you're almost asking about when they first came for treatment. So again, that will have dropped their chances of finding a difference. Um, so in the control group, they were on a waiting list. They had no treatment. We wouldn't expect much change. And the added value score, near as damn it, gave us zero. zero. The intervention group, we thought we should be able to replicate the, the effect size that they found in the trial. And we really weren't far off. And then just for interest, the kind of change scores that clinicians like me would use in the clinic, look how much they're overestimating. And that's why you need something like this. Now, the SEQ had a value score will only work for groups of people. The confidence intervals around individual estimates would not be reliable. But in terms of seeing if a team or a clinic is doing okay, certainly for behavior problems, and this has been replicated, not quite as spectacular results, but certainly pulling them back the, um, the way that you would expect with another study. Both of these are published, and I can give you references if you want. But when you look by the presenting problem, actually, there is an indication that the type of problem might influence what you find on the added value score. So this is data from Cork, and it was an analysis done by Andy Fugard when he worked there. So that's just a little taster of some of the th amazing things that people have done with this data over the years. And I'm sure there are lots of people here who would really like to get their hands on this data. I know I certainly would. Um, it is being archived at the moment. The process of negotiating quite what is archived and, and what isn't is underway. Um, there will be a controlled version of the data set will be made available via um, NHS Digital's data access request service. The users will need to complete an application to DARS. And we anticipate um, later this year the data should become available. And that's all we're being told. We can't tell you any more than that. Um, but I think we should all um, push very hard to access these data because actually the work that's been done before has been hugely important and policy relevant. The other thing to say is we consented to linkage. There is a little bit of money left to do linkage. Um, and we're hoping it will be to the National Pupil Database, although there are issues um, to resolve both within NHS Digital and the MPD to make that happen. Of all the databases we could link to, actually for this, these data, the National Pupil Database is by far the most important, but hopefully also HES data, attendance at, at casualty for self-harm, admissions to hospital, other things would be useful. Um, and they were consented to follow up. Um, so it would be really useful 
to try and follow these people up if we could. And that's the end of all our presentations, I think. Mm -hmm.